critical race theory, COVID, January 6th, the elections that don't seem to unite us, the divisions in our country and churches seem to be deepening, sometimes turning into disdain. How will this all end and can it change? Our guest today is no stranger to tackling contentious issues and doing so with conviction and hope for us all. Dr. Derwin Gray is a former professional football player and the founding and lead pastor of Transformation Church, a multi-ethnic community located in Charlotte, North Carolina metro area. He's here to shed light on how Christians can lead and love in these polarized times. Welcome, Derwin. Thank you so much, brother. It's always good to... Uh, to be with you. It's such a, a wonderful time to to be alive. I think sometimes as followers of Jesus, we actually forget that this is not the new heavens and the new earth yet. So therefore, uh, Ephesians 6, 10 through 20 is a constant reminder for us to put on the full armor of God because there are spiritual forces at work and we have to deal with not only that, but the world and the flesh. And so um, to be a follower of Jesus is to be in this cosmic battle. And it is good news to know that because of the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony, um, that the enemy has been defeated. And so we live from a posture of love and grace and mercy and humility. And so I'm excited that God has saw fit to allow me to be a part of it this time. Derwin, that that's deeply encouraging that you would lead us off both with scripture, but this perspective that uh, the blood of the lamb really has won a victory for us. This is kind of a positive vision of the present, but also of the future that awaits. Um, but that's not something I would necessarily say, given the beginnings of your life would have been the trajectory. So wind us back. I mean, you had some challenges to start life that would have been maybe surprising to see how things have panned out. Yeah, um, God has been incredibly gracious. Uh, my mom was 16 when she was pregnant with me. My dad was 18. Uh, they were babies having a baby. Uh, both of them struggled with various issues in the early 70s. And so my grandparents uh, from middle school up primarily raised me. And so both my mom and dad struggled with various issues. And so um, I thought everybody was on welfare. I thought that living where I lived was was normative. I thought that violence was normative. Uh, we didn't have uh, we we didn't, quote unquote, go to church. And so growing up in the state of Texas, um, football is the religion. And so for me, football gave me a sense of identity and purpose and significance. And if I played good, I thought love, but it also was a vehicle to get a football scholarship. So um, for me, the way out of my context and my environment was football. Football was a game I loved, but it was also a job. And so I was able to go to Brigham Young University. And so you have an African-American kid that goes all the way up to Utah to a predominantly white Mormon school. And people go, what was that like? And at first it was disorienting. But now as I look back at God's sovereign hand, it was actually what I needed to be a multi-ethnic church planting pastor, because I've learned how to get along with people from different contexts. I also met my wife there at BYU, became a legendary football player, and then ultimately got drafted to the NFL. So in my mind, in 1993, when I got drafted in the NFL, I'm like, this is my heaven. I just knew everything would get better. The money would help my family. Uh, my status would change. And after about a year, it was like, none of that happened. And none of it happened. It, I wasn't playing much. It wasn't fun. It was never enough money to go around. The money didn't save my family. Uh, my second year was a little bit better. But by my third year, I'm a team captain. Uh, I'm playing well. But at the end of that third year, Walter, is when I realize there has to be more to life than this. So at 25, I'm having an existential crisis because I'm going, OK. The money hasn't fixed my family. Um, I'm still angry at my dad for leaving me. 
I can't get over the things that happened to me. I can't forgive myself for the things that I did. I can't love my wife the way she deserves to be loved. And I'm living with this perpetual crippling anxiety and fear that one day I'm not going to be an NFL football player anymore. Who would I be? And ultimately, that's what idolatry does. Idolatry says this, worship me and I'll satisfy you. But it makes a promise it can never keep. And so what you thought was going to satisfy you becomes a means of anxiety and worry. But by God's grace, I had a teammate. His name was Steve Grant, but his nickname was the Naked Preacher because every day after practice, he would take a shower and dry off and wrap a towel around his waist. And he'd ask my teammates, he'd say, do you know Jesus? And in my mind, I'm going, bro, do you know you're half naked? It was like the strangest thing. But one day I'm sitting in my locker and I see him coming towards me and I'm like, oh, no. And then he asked me a question to change my life. He said, uh, Ricky D. Gray, do you know Jesus? And I began a five year relationship from 1993 to 1997 in which I saw him live the gospel He communicated the gospel. And on August 2nd, 1997, in a small dorm room, my fifth year in NFL training camp in Anderson, Indiana, after lunch, I walked back to my dorm room, called my wife on the phone and said, I want to be more committed to you and I want to be committed to Jesus. And that's when I was born again. You you know, um, it, it was very much like a John Wesley moment, like a strange warming of the heart. But the way I describe it is. I knew that I knew that I knew that I was loved, that I was forgiven. And for three nights, I would cry myself to sleep after practice, thinking, how could someone like Jesus love somebody like me? Now I know all Jesus has is somebody like me to love sinners. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so I've never gotten over the love of Jesus and his rescuing grace. Derwin, that is just so compelling. I mean, your life trajectory uh, and the fact that there was the promise of kind of the religion of football uh, in transforming your identity personally, but also your situation culturally, socially, where you would be situated, opportunities you would have yeah, uh, but that was ultimately an, an idol that could not fulfill uh, those things. Um, so why didn't you, I mean, take me from that to <laughs> why didn't you just become a, a football chaplain at that moment? Like, <laughs> that's the context you're in. It, it seems like maybe that's what the Lord could have called you to. You moved from that to eventually being the pastor of a, a, a multi-ethnic church. You're going to have to connect some more dots for me here. Yeah, yeah. So... For my wife and I, she was unchurched as well. She came to faith about six months before I did through a woman at her job. And so that's why my wife and I are both very passionate about um, congregations should be missionary units, a community of missionaries, because it was people at our jobs who led us to faith. So she came to faith about six months um, before I did. And so we didn't know words like evangelism, discipleship, pastoring. Um, I got invited to speak at a youth event in the fall of 1999, and I was going to turn it down because I grew up as a compulsive stutterer. And I just remember in the shower, you know, praying and saying, God, why would you send me to go talk? You know, I don't talk well. I'll pay for somebody to go, but don't send me. And I just I just sensed the Lord saying, If I can raise my son from the dead, I can raise your tongue to talk, but you have to go to see the miracle. And so my wife and our daughter, who was really little at the time, we went to Columbia, South Carolina, and I shared my testimony and a bunch of kids got saved. And then people started asking me to come speak and my wife would organize it. And before you knew it, we started a ministry called One Heart at a Time Ministry. And people would say, man, you have a theological mind. You should go to seminary. I was like, I don't want to go to a seminary. They said, no, seminary. That's where you learn theology. So I went to seminary. But then in 2005, after, you know, basically six years of traveling the country and speaking, both my wife and I couldn't understand this one poignant thing. We couldn't understand why Christian churches were so 
segregated based on ethnicity. Hmm. You know, it's either like an all white event or an all black event. And as we read the Bible, we saw the early church was Jewish people and everybody else. That everybody else is the word Gentile. So in the Greco-Roman world, there was incredible ethnic diversity. And we saw that the Apostle Paul's main contention was getting Jews and Gentiles to be the people of God through the grace of God, because God made a covenant with Abraham. That racial reconciliation, ethnic reconciliation is a part of the gospel, that Jesus is redeeming work, life, death, resurrection, his justifying power is so that God's people could be one. For you will know my disciples because they love one another. Father, pray that they would be one. And so because we didn't grow up in church, we just read the Bible and believed it. And so I began to ask pastors and I would lay out kind of what I said. And I never got a biblical reason or answer for segregation. Um, And I know we don't like using that word, but in essence, that's what we do is we build our churches around cultural preferences instead of around the gospel. And so my wife and I said, well, if we ever start a church, of course, we never will. But if we did, it would be a church after Paul's churches rooted in the gospel of King Jesus, where ethnic unity in the gospel is intrinsic and our unity and love will set us on mission to invite others into the peace of God, the shalom of God. And eventually we complained and complained and God said, well, you can either complain or you can do something about it. And so that's what led us to plant Transformation Church on February 7th, 2010. Our first service, 701 people showed up and we've got close to 9000 people that are part of our church now. And Walter, uh, you would not believe how many people told me. A multi-ethnic church will never work. What are you doing? Why are you doing this? You need to just preach the gospel. And I'm like, okay, so what is your view of the gospel? And ultimately, they would tell me, well, Jesus died for our sins so that we don't go to hell. I said, well, let's read Ephesians because that's a part of what it. But the good news is that Jew and Gentile, the mystery of Christ, are co-heirs in Christ, that Jesus not just died to forgive our sins, but to create a family with different colored skins. And his family is to bring heaven to earth through the power of the Holy Spirit, that our unity bears witness to his resurrection. Our love for one another bears witness to his resurrection. Our witness to the other across ethnic, gender, and social boundaries shows the power of the resurrected king. And God has just blessed us immensely. He has blessed us immensely. Darwin, this is what I was alluding to earlier about this kind of comprehensive application of the good news of Jesus and word and deed. Your church is built on this vision of not just uh, personal salvation, salvation from our sins personally, from Satan, from darkness, from eternal separation from God, but we're saved into something, not just from something, but into something. We're saved mm-hmm. into a family, into a vision of a, a new mission uh, in this world that will yeah. have eternal consequences. Um, clearly thousands of people are on board with you with that vision Mm -hmm. and and your books have been captivating and compelling for uh, thousands more. Um, But I would venture to wonder at least, and certainly now ask, um, in these times when issues of race, for instance, and we could take many other issues, but race, for instance, Mm -hmm. Um, has become so contentious, yeah. whether it's what happened with George Floyd's murder, the Black Lives Movement protests. I mean, these are <clears throat> some defining moments in our culture of the last several years. Um, did that present stressors for your tr- church? It did. Uh, but one of the good things about building your church on, building Jesus's church on a gospel that is holistic is we have been talking about these particular issues from day one. And so it wasn't like our messaging had to change. And if I could just throw this caveat out, um, as horrific as the George Floyd incident was and some of the other uh, shootings of unarmed black men was, 
that's merely the surface of the level of the injustice. Uh, we're not even talking about redlining. We're not even talking about uh, banking. We're not even talking about jobs and those other things, right? So um, I think what you have to do, and one of the reasons why we have a lot of conservative white evangelicals in our church is they know that I'm going to exegete the scripture. Um, they love that I exegete the scripture. So I don't I don't use buzzwords. I keep it very gospelly, and I show them, for example, if you go to the story of the Good Samaritan, for example, if you go to the story of the woman at the well, that's Jesus communicating how the gospel creates a ethnically unified people. Even Jesus' missional mandate in or his, his messianic mandate in Luke 4, 16 through 30, Jesus proclaims what he claimed to do, but then he tells two obscure stories about Elijah and Elisha who did miracles for Gentiles. And then the next verses say, and they wanted to throw him off a cliff because they wanted him to make Israel great again. And he came to fulfill God's covenant with Abraham to create a great family of every nation, tribe, and tongue through his shed blood and through his resurrection. Um, but Walter, this is what I'm finding. Number one, when you've only been taught a gospel that takes you to heaven through substitutionary atonement only, you're going to respond negatively to a holistic understanding of the gospel. Number two, one of the things I have to do with my white brothers and sisters that are part of Transformation Church to make up probably 55% of Transformation Church is number one, to let them know you don't have to be guilty for slavery. You were not alive. You don't have to be guilty for it. Now, acknowledge that slavery benefited your ancestors and have benefited you. So that's one. Number two, your identity is not in the United States of America. The Constitution didn't die for you on the cross. Jesus, the Word of God, in human form, the eternal Son of God, Son of Man, the Lamb of God, died for you. He is your status. And because of resurrection power, we don't have to live in the old adage. Thirdly, America as a nation belongs to all of us that God has sovereignly placed us in. My fourth great-grandfather's name was Moses Davis. He fought for the Virginia Colored Calvary in the Civil War for the Union. So within my blood is patriotism for this flag of the United States of America. And then lastly, when people of color, when black people bring up systemic injustice from the past, it's not saying that we don't love America. It's not saying that we're being victims. All it's saying is there was a past injustice that has led to where we are today. So let's link arms together to say this won't happen again on our watch. But that's difficult to do when we've simply reduced the gospel to a self-help program, when we reduce the gospel to voting one particular party. Uh, political idolatry has poisoned the well in the church greatly. And it's really sad to see how Jesus's name has been misused and abused. Mm. Wow. There's just so much to unpack there. And you mentioned, you know, Jesus, as he proclaims this comprehensive gospel, you know, takes uh, Israel, at least uh, the historic political entity, out of the center of the picture and makes this kind of new work of God the center of the picture, uh, that people wanted to toss him off the side of a cliff. Um, I suspect you've probably had that response as well, that people wanted to, you know, at least metaphorically, <laughs> toss you off the side of the cliff. Yeah, usually online, but never in person. Hmm. Yeah, no, one, no one's going to do that with you in person. Brother. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's uh, some keyboard warriors, but in, in person, usually, usually not. So I just what, I've just learned to delete people. What, so what are the critiques that do come in if, you know, from these keyboard warriors? Oh, man. Uh, probably the biggest one is your race baiting. And so a lot of times when I have that, this is what I'll say. I'll say, okay, guys, this is what I'm going to do. I'm never going to preach on race again from the Bible. So I'm never going to mention 
that the Jews were slaves in Egypt, that they had to deal with the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Zebuvites, the Prezivites. I'm never going to talk about the Babylonians, the Assyrians, Samaritans. I'm never going to talk about the Romans, and I'm not going to talk about the new heavens, or new, new heavens, new, uh, every nation, tribe, and tongue, nor will I discuss that Jesus was a Jew. Well, guess what, friend? You have no Bible. The question is, why don't we show the importance of ethnicity. Yes, there's a one, only one race, the human race, but the human race is comprised of different ethnicities and God's image is born in each one of them. And God made a covenant with Abraham that he's going to give Abraham a family made up of all of the ethnicities. And so that's one of the critiques. And when I present that, I usually don't get a response back. But a lot of times, uh, and it works in multiple ways. Uh, we have had um, uh, black people at our church who are like, oh, we got a black pastor now. Now it's our turn. I'm like, well, what do you mean our turn? No, it's Jesus's turn. Hmm. Um, and, and so um, ethnocentrism is a sin that runs so deep. That's why the Holy Spirit has to run deeper. Hmm. Again, really, really compelling vision and um, what a great response to that kind of critique from keyboard warriors you you talk about. Um, I, ha I have to go here because you brought up issues like redlining, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the ways in which certain neighborhoods were seg segregated and segmented off, or uh, your own background yeah. in terms of welfare. Uh, you talk about systemic issues with the legal system and... Mm -hmm. When you bring up systemic issues, even if you talk about the gospel uh, in this comprehensive way, I imagine systemic issues produce very different responses depending on life background. <coughs> yeah. Um, and people offer different solutions depending on their political views to these issues. Yeah. Um, are you finding that to be the case in your yeah. church? And, and what, what, does, um, what does that look like? You know, uh, probably not as much um, in our church, but outside of our church. Um, a lot of times, you know, I'll get, um, well, systemic injustice does not exist. And my first question is, are you a Christian? Yes, I am. Do you believe that total depravity affects every single human being? Yes. So if total depravity affects every single human being, don't you think that that depravity would affect the systems that those depraved people are in. So you think total depravity just miss banking and policing and all these things. And so they'll be like, well, no, I go, okay, that's what we mean. Hmm. And then secondly, people will say, well, systemic injustice doesn't exist. And I'll go, you know what? You're right. And I'll say, do you think that white evangelical Christians, do you think they're persecuted in America? Yes. Do you think that there are persecution of Christians on college campuses? Yes. Do you think the me media persecutes them? Yes. So you do believe in systemic injustice? Well, uh, no. I go, no, you just agreed that you do. And, and so I think what we have to do is look at the world through the context of Jesus in the first century Second Temple Jewish world in order to navigate our 21st century world. Typically, what we do is we look through the lenses of our political party. So the Republican Party doesn't exist anymore. So the populist party of Trump is a lens that people look through or um, the super left leaning Democratic Party. And for unbelievers, that's all they have. But for, but for believers, it's important for us that we view the world through the lenses of Jesus and his kingdom, i.e. primarily the Sermon on the Mount. Hmm. And so political idolatry is uh, it's a corrosive, uh, corrosive, corrupting entity that is hurting the church deeply. And um, a lot of churches are decreasing and not growing because our mission is no longer to make disciples. It's to make disciples of particular political parties. So, Derwin, one takeaway that I could imagine people saying from what you've just said um, is it's so corrosive, so corrupting. We should just not be involved at all. So are you advocating that we disengage from 
political uh, parties, from uh, the life of our civic uh, society? Like, what, what, what are the implications of what you're saying? I actually think we need to be more political. And what I mean by more political is the kingdom of God. <laughs> that, that's what I'm saying, because the message of Jesus is very political. He's saying that Putin is not emperor. Uh, Joe Biden is not emperor. Uh, no, Jesus is the ruling emperor. So therefore, whatever country you're in, we have a civic duty to honor Christ with the vote that we can to the best of our ability. And so therefore, what I tell our church is this, who you vote for is none of my concern. How you treat those who vote different from you is more of my concern. So if you only have two parties to choose from, and neither party is the kingdom of God, you've got to do the best that you can with your vote. But how do you treat your brothers and sisters? And how do you treat people who don't vote like you? So for example, 90% of black evangelical Christians will probably end up voting for Kamala Harris, even though they are not pro-LGBT or pro-trans or pro-abortion. But they don't find room in the party of Trump. And you'll have good Christians who don't agree with Trump. They're, they're not into him being a, uh, a, a felon and the other things. And also, uh, now that the issue of abortion has gone to the states, the Republican Party is now a pro-choice party. And so when you only have two parties, you can only do the very best that you can do. But here's what I mean by being more political. So for us as a, as a church, what I want to know is what are we doing as a church to bring in the kingdom of God? So uh, last year, we paid about $13 million of medical debt for people in the state of South Carolina and North Carolina. Why? Because we want to be the kingdom of God. Uh, in the last 15 years, 14 years, <clears throat> we have made 1 million meals for people in need. Why? Because we want to be the kingdom of God. We have a free grocery store that 500 people come to every week. Why? Because we want to be the kingdom of God. We have partnerships with crisis pregnancy centers. Why? Because we want to be the kingdom of God. We have helped refugees in Syria, in Ukraine, and Latin America. Why? Because we want to be the kingdom of God. So yes, have your civic duty. That is what we should do as citizens. But also, what are we doing as a church to mobilize to be the hands and feet of Jesus? That's a vision and a set of actions, a missional way of living that I imagine would be attractive. Doesn't matter if you're a Democrat or Republican, doesn't matter what your political views might be. That's such a compelling vision. I imagine it would be attractive to folks from all sorts of political persuasions. I want to believe that to be true, but Derwin, these last several years have um, seen a sorting geographically yeah. Uh, depending on political views, zip codes are becoming identifiable based yeah. on political parties. Churches are becoming yes. more and more identifiable. Please tell me that there are, in fact, Republicans, Democrats in your church. And Oh, gosh, yeah. Okay, so how, <laughs> yeah. how do you navigate the fact that in the end, people are going to be voting and votes really do matter mm -hmm. and— People are side-eyeing each other in their pew seats based on votes generally, or they're self-sorting out because they don't want to be there anymore. Yeah. Like, what are you doing to help this not be the case? Teach the gospel and call out their political idolatry and sin and invite those who want to leave to leave. Uh, we had a person recently on staff who... Um, who left because we were not um, MAGA. Um, we've had people uh, leave because we're not secular progressive left. And my job as a pastor is to not disappoint Jesus, not them. And my job is to call out sin and to proclaim the gospel of grace. And a part of our discipleship and spiritual formation is to love the other and to think the best of the uh, uh, the uh, other, because what we do is we go, if someone votes for Trump, that means they're this. Well, that's not true. 
If someone votes for Kamala Harris, this means this. Well, that's not true. And so what we want to do is build community and have unity around Jesus. And we can vigorously debate those things without being donkey butts. Like we do have the fruit of the spirit to have love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and faithfulness and self-control. This is a discipleship moment. And, And then, Walter, if I can just take a step back and I want everybody to hear my heart. Uh, we as Americans are so whiny. Goodness gracious. Do you know what the first century church went through? Hmm. The persecution. Jesus told Peter and the disciples, the gates of hell will not prevail against my church. Right. The church has outlasted brutal dictators and emperors and the dark ages. And it's going to outlast Putin. It's going to outlast America The church will still stand because it is standing on Jesus. And so let's not have chronological snobbery that this is the worst time ever. It's not. And I think it's important for us to know that we serve a God who is timeless, who gives us the gospel in a timely way. And so I think we're so unaccustomed to living by faith that we have to have these man-made tools, right? Now, are politics important? Yes, they are. Because, for example, um, I wouldn't be free without politics. I believe God used that. The civil rights, women being able to vote. I mean, all types of things, right? Uh, I mean, even even you as an Asian American, like laws are important. Government is a good thing from God. And so our civic duty is an expression of the gospel. And this last point, since the beginning of the church, 2,000 years, 99.9% of all people who've ever followed Jesus, and even to this very day, have no clue what a Republican or Democrat is. And so if we have such a myopic view that our salvation is tied to who we vote for, then that means the overwhelming majority of people who've ever been saved were not truly saved because they were not a Republican or a Democrat. For goodness sakes, in the 60s, the Republicans were the Democrats and the Democrats were the Republicans. Mm. Mm. It's a perspective that situates us <clears throat> with a little bit of humility. I mean, we, our problems, uh, as bad as we may feel they are, uh, is not nearly as bad as what the church yeah. has experienced uh, over the centuries. Um you dive into issues, clearly, you dive into the issues. You dive into the discipleship of those issues. Many folks are in communities that don't know what political discipleship might even look like. Mm-hmm. Um, they may have some sense of what you're describing and how you treat each other. Uh, you, you, you talk about the fruit of the spirit. You talk about the ability to love people who are not like you. Uh, the complexity with which people vote. You you talk ab- about the fact that just because a person votes this way, do you know everything about that person? Do you even know why they voted that way? No. So y- you give us some guardrails or, you know, perspective on how to treat. But that still leaves us um, not understanding how do we even process the issues? Um, how do we understand a biblical worldview <laughs> that engages and forms us uh, in the, the matters that are at hand. Mm-hmm. That, that's a tough nut to crack, um, but is. clearly you're, you're seeking to crack it because you're mentioning all these issues in the same breath as you're <clears throat> mentioning the holistic application of the gospel. So what are you doing to help your people in this way? Well, you have the Bible in one hand, and you have the, your cultural context in the other hand, because if I don't disciple the people of Transformation Church, CNN's going to, Fox News is going to, MSNBC is going to, some Yahoo on uh, TikTok is going to. And so um, when we read the Gospels, right, when we read the New Testament, when we read the Old Testament, let's just look at, let's just take the book of Colossians. When Paul writes that to the churches at Colossae, He is engaging with a real life issue of Gnosticism. So it's important for us to take contemporary issues and show how the eternal God swallow those things up so we can navigate those seas. 
Here's one of my contentions, Walter, is I feel like in some strands of the, of the church, everything is a pop psychology, self-help m- message, no theology. So the people aren't equipped, equipped, equipped at all. But then the other side is almost like this new right wing fundamentalism. So in many ways, I feel like we're living in a new fundamentalism versus evangelical perspective, right? And then there's this left-leaning secular progressive that dis- disloses, uh, uh, diffuses the resurrection, uh, the, the, the Bible, where it's like social justice means all white people are bad, you know? And, and so I think it's important. I'm an advocate of what was Jesus talking about? Who was he talking to in his day and why? And how do we show these eternal gospel principles to be lived out in the present reality? But but with all of this complexity, it can be summed up to this. Love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as you love yourself. And when, so, so, and when someone says, what does that look like? You tell them, let me tell you a story about a good Samaritan. He found a man on the side of the road that was supposed to be his enemy. But you know what he did? He banished him. He took him to an inn and paid for him to get well. Go do likewise. Be merciful. Wow. Derwin, this is, again, such a biblically drenched approach that you're taking, you know, immersed, soaked in in the scriptures. Um. I want to believe that it's transformational because I've experienced it myself as transformational. Uh, your church bears witness in the work that it's doing in the communities and situated in. Um, w- we would love to hear ways in which you have <laughs> seen folks or elements of your church move in this formative way from, yeah. I didn't know that the Bible would speak to this. In fact, I was more shaped by whatever political <laughs> background that I was. Like, have you actually seen that movement of someone oh, moving gosh, from a yeah. place of like opposition and contention? Heck uh, yeah. To, okay, what, so what does that look yeah. like? Yeah, it looks like somebody coming up to you and saying, man, when I first came to this church, I believed one way, but now I believe differently. I've had people say things like, um, I didn't believe all this multiracial stuff. I thought it was CRT, but I've never even heard you mention CRT. All you've done is teach the Bible. Um, I've had people say I didn't even like white people when I came um, to this church. Now some of my closest friends are white Americans. I would have people say I had no idea what redlining was. Um, I, I mean, the stories go on and on and on. That doesn't mean it's not difficult. That doesn't mean that people still don't leave. Um, so, you know what, Walter, as you were talking, if you would give me a moment to pastor you, Mm. uh, this, this may seem kind of weird, but let, let me, let me, let me just walk through because I can sense in your heart and in your eyes, you know, that what I'm saying is true, but I think you've had to fight so many battles and so many voices saying that it's not true, that it has discouraged you. Mm. And here's what I know about you. I know you believe that God is sovereign. Amen. Amen to that. So if God is sovereign, it's not my job to change people. It's my privilege to proclaim and to embody the gospel as the spirit empowers me and then to take my gluteus maximus to sleep. Because I'm not the Holy Spirit. And for people who are responding to the Holy Spirit, he's going to change them. Secondly, there is a whole generation of people that are not even on the radar that are coming to faith by the thousands who are going to embody a holistic gospel. And it's going to come from places and people who are unlikely. And it's happening. Matter of fact, a few nights ago at the University of uh, Ohio State, some football players were part of this 
mass e- event and a bunch of people got saved and baptized. Other students, it's happening all across the country and it's a multi-ethnic uprising that's taking place. And, and and so you and I don't have to worry. Like it's going to happen. God does not leave himself without a witness. And so can this happen? Yes. Is it happening? Yes. And squeaky wheels tend to make the most noise. Mm. But God is doing an incredible work. Mm. You have pastored me. That is so encouraging. You have shepherd, shepherded my soul. Thank you. Um, leave us with a final exhortation, encouragement, maybe a piece of scripture, something yeah. that would take us out in this Yeah, moment. Yeah, you, you know, so a lot of times, particularly if justice is your passion, like, I don't like to see things that are wrong. And sometimes we have to be patient with people. In Acts chapter 10, Peter has this incredible moment where he goes to Cornelius's house. And in, 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 in Acts 10, 32 or so, he tells Cornelius, it's not even lawful for me as a Jew to enter your home, but I know that God is not a respecter of persons. All who call upon his name will be saved. So <clears throat> multi-ethnic church, racial reconciliation in the gospel, everything is good. Little time goes by and Peter goes down to Antioch and uh, Barnabas is there and the apostle Paul is there and Peter is sitting down and he's eating Gentile food with Gentiles. And remember, these Gentiles could have been from 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 China, uh, what we know as Korea. And I mean, it could have, I mean, the, the greco Roman world was incredibly diverse. And so he's eating their foods. He's with them. And then all of a sudden in Galatians 2, 11, it says, and a party of James came. And then it says that Peter got up from the table with the Gentiles. It says that his hypocrisy even made Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, join in the hypocrisy. And in verse 14 of Galatians 2, Paul says this, when I saw that he was deviating from the truth of the gospel. So if anybody says that ethnic reconciliation is not in the gospel, take them to this text. Mm. How you treat people is the overflow of this gospel work. So let me pause here. You have Peter who walked with Jesus for three years, restored by Jesus at the resurrection, who saw God's multi-ethnic hand with Cornelius, but yet and still... He was afraid. He lacked courage of the party of James. Some of our brothers and sisters lack courage. And what we do at that point is we lovingly call them out for not walking in step with the gospel. And then we proclaim why we live differently, which Paul does in Galatians 2.20. And I'll leave us with this. I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Though I live in this body, it's by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So Paul says, I can no longer be a racist because Jesus has made me a gracist. May we all be gracious. Thank you, Dr. Derwin Gray, for pastoring all of us. Thanks for having me, brother.